Good morning. I'm Dr. Scott Kaiser. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for the Motion Picture Television Fund. We're going to get started promptly here right on time at 9 a.m., 9.01 a.m. I want to thank you all for being here. I see that we have many attendees still logging on. I invite you to uh, chime in in the chat. Uh, let us know that you're here. Uh, let us know a little bit about you. And uh, again, just wonderful to have you all here for this virtual social isolation impact summit. And to begin our very wonderful program today, I'm going to hand it over to Bob Beecher, the president and CEO of the Motion Picture Television Fund, MPTF, and Paul Irving, the chairman of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, also a distinguished scholar in residence at the USC Davis School of Gerontology and coincidentally, the chair of the board of Encore.org. And we'll be hearing uh, in a bit from Mark Friedman, the CEO and founder of Encore.org. So I'll hand it over to you and uh, thank you so much for kicking it off. Thanks, Scott. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And Paul, good to see you. And thanks to you and your amazing team at the Milken Center uh, for the Future of Aging for co-hosting this event with us today. Uh, so may maybe we can start by having you uh, share a little bit about your organization for those who don't know, already know it. Sure, Bob. Bob, thanks. It's great being with you too. It's, it's always been a, a delight visiting your campus and, and uh, watching the amazing work that you and all the team at MPTF do. So, so just very quickly, the Center for the Future of Aging is part of the nonprofit, nonpartisan Milton Institute, which is a, uh, a think tank and an, and an action tank, uh, uh, certainly we, we, we hope, uh, focused on healthy, productive, and purposeful aging. But I have to say, in the time of COVID, as much as we've focused on the impacts on older workers and, uh, and, the, and the challenges of caregiving and, and, the, and the like, one of our principal concerns has been how to address the risks of of COVID to, to healthy longevity. And that's why this session today is so important and, and so timely. This, this challenge has, uh, has elevated awareness of something that's been going on a long time. And I'm really glad that we're taking it on. So welcome to, to all. Bob, t tell us a little bit about, um, about MP MPTF for, for those who don't already know uh, about your work. Okay. Thanks, Paul. And uh, as you know, it's, it's hard for me to tell you just a little bit about MPTF, uh, but I'll try to compress it. Uh, thanks to the uh, visionary industry pioneer, Mary Pickford, uh, in 1921, MPTF started off uh, as a uh, charity supporting members of the then film community uh, in their time of need. Uh, and uh, We've been here now almost 100 years, uh, and obviously the uh, organization has evolved since then, but we still stick to our mission uh, of taking care of entertainment industry members. We've gone from, uh, in the early days, hundreds to then thousands of grants of charitable assistance to a much uh, broader, more diverse program. Today we have a 20-acre campus in uh, the West Valley of Los Angeles, where we take care of 225 active seniors who live here with a sense of purpose and engagement. And we've got 20 plus social workers in the community uh, assisting uh, working and retired industry members uh, get through the trials of daily living. And uh, Really everything we do, we think about uh, doing it successfully at MPTF and then building it to scale and making it into national models. So, so for, example, for example, the palliative care program, the community palliative care program we have, it's a national model for, for palliative care. So, so, so we're, we're going to deal, obviously, with the broader, yeah. broader uh, issues of social isolation and loneliness today. But, but Bob, I've got to ask you, just, just because it's a matter of concern for me and because I know your operation so well, you, you've had to deal directly on the ground with the tragedies of, of COVID, I know, over the last uh, several weeks and, and months. And I'm just wondering, you know, how are, how are things at MPTF 
what do you see as kind of the direct impacts on the, on the work that you and Scott and your team are doing every day? Right. Good question. So uh, on March 9th, very early on, uh, we shut down our campus uh, to any outside visitors and any social gathering, communal uh, activity among our residents. And within the next two weeks, really, uh, the productions around the world shut down and the people we serve, the industry workforce, uh, were sent home to shelter in place. So we, we knew what was coming next, widespread social isolation, loneliness, fear, anxiety, stress, depression, uh, and, and there it was. Uh, how, do we, how do we know, you know what's going on? We know our, our campus members, obviously, but our social workers have made in this three and a half months around 10,000 calls uh, to working members of the industry to check in with them and understand their situation and provide some case management uh, resources and referrals. So it's had a profound impact both for us on the campus and in the community. On the campus, uh, we created something called Organized Chaos, uh, which is a variety show that we do 20 hours a week uh, out of our theater hosted by uh, the executive producer of MPTF Studios, Jen Clymer. Uh, it's resident driven, it's interactive. It is uh, something that the residents have, you know, told us they truly enjoy. They, they come on as hosts of shows, participants, et cetera. In the community, we've been administering $10 million of uh, re relief funds, both from MPTF and other organizations in the industry, like the Motion Picture Academy, Netflix, Warner Media, Viacom, the Directors Guild, uh, and others, and trying to keep our industry members, you know, financially sound. We've been doing our call sheet program. I know you know that, Paul. Uh, so we have been making peer-to-peer uh, -peer calls uh, to industry members by industry volunteers. Uh, and then we stood up a, a new program called Care Calls, where we've literally made thousands of calls. Industry volunteers have made thousands of calls to retired members of our community. So we are, uh, you know, we've, and, and people learning so much about each other, creating new bonds, creating new friendships. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to say who knew that in 2020, uh, in the middle of a COVID uh, disaster, the telephone would become so valuable uh, in breaking down the barriers of physical isolation and connecting people, bringing fresh voices into people's lives and bringing a little bit of joy. So that's really what we've been uh, keeping ourselves busy with. Every, everything old is new again. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. You know, our, our teams have worked so hard to organize today's summit. Uh, why is social isolation such a critically important challenge to you and your well, organization? And, and how has COVID-19 elevated the stakes for that? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that uh, we have several thousand people with us today uh, speaks, to, speaks to the understanding, at least in the field, about this, this as, as the other pandemic, in a sense, the thing that Maybe just as important and less recognized than the than the specific physical uh, characteristics of, of COVID. Um, uh, many of us have have known, and I know uh, Bob, you you and Scott have been on on first base on this for for a long time. Have recognized uh, the the risks of isolation, the objective fact, and loneliness manifestation uh, often of of isolation as as a public health. Uh, uh, pandemic in, in a sense for for years. In fact, uh, many of us know that the former Prime Minister of, of Great Britain appointed a Minister of Loneliness a, a couple of years ago. This is not just an American uh, challenge, but obviously COVID has has dramatically uh, increased the the risk and and the impacts. And and for anyone who thinks that this is a soft notion, that I think sometimes people say to themselves, well, gee, this do just doesn't somehow feel like cancer or cardiovascular disease or something else. The relationship 
and I'm sure Scott and others will talk about this, the relationship between isolation and, and loneliness and disease is really remarkable. And I'm talking about a whole, a risk, a whole range of chronic diseases uh, and, and, and brain diseases, including dementia. So, uh, so I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to tackle this. And I, I'm, I'm optimistic about what can come out of our session today. Couldn't, as I say, couldn't be more, t more timely. Yeah. You know, I know, I know, but just maybe back to your experience at, yeah. uh, on, on campus, you know, I know that um, you're an optimistic guy by, by, by nature, uh, glass is half full person. So, so I, I suspect you're seeing the prospect of some positive things coming out of all of this, not just the experience at MPTF, but maybe the broader experience. Thoughts yeah, on that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's something that I think about all the time and, and I think helps keep me centered because there's, there's got to be some, there's so much darkness around COVID, there's got to be some light as well. And uh, to me, you know, the one and only blessing of COVID-19 is that it has made to many uh, what was invisible, visible. Uh, and that's the beginning of all powerful activism. So it's ripped the Band-Aid off and exposed inequities. And whether you think about those along the dimensions of race or age or both, uh, it has, I think, sensitized us to the pain of others. And that has taken expression, I think, in protests and other forms of social reframing and I think it's brought social isolation and loneliness uh, dead center on the radar of the broader community uh, who, who hasn't experienced some of that along the way. And so I think it's created an enormous opportunity uh, for all of us who are focused on social isolation and loneliness to change things around. And then, you know, rather than returning to uh, the old normal, uh, People keep on talking about returning to normal. I think uh, what we need to understand is that the old normal wasn't so good for a lot of people. Uh, and collectively, starting with everyone today on the summit, uh, we can look forward uh, to a new normal that is more equitable, uh, more empathetic, and more driven by a real sense of community uh, to, to support each other. And I truly hope that's, that's where we can go with all of this, starting with today's summit. Well, thank you, Bob and Paul, for joining us. This has been great. Uh, now we're going to be uh, joined by Lisa Marsh Ryerson, who is our event sponsor, AARP Foundation, our event sponsor, uh, to be in, kicking off the program. And what a great note to kick it off. Uh, so as we wait for Lisa to come up here again, I really just want to sincerely thank AARP Foundation for joining us as our event sponsor. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, and Scott. I'll note that people are logging on. We have uh, 922 in attendance at the moment, just proving how much this issue resonates with people. We have people from coast to coast. And I really just want to thank you, you Lisa, for helping us, particularly at MPTF, uh, all along the way in our journey to make a difference in helping keep particularly seniors and vulnerable seniors uh, engaged and connected. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Scott. It's such a treat to be with you. And uh, like you, I was uh, reading the chat during the opening and just thrilled to see our colleagues and those who will be new colleagues who are joining on across this nation. and. And also, Scott, to see you and thank you and Bob and Paul and Nora and Maureen and others, because we've been working together in this space for a number of years now. And it really is terrific to see the, uh, that this topic is getting its deserved attention. Social isolation and loneliness are serious public health crises, and we can only solve it if we're in it together. Absolutely. Um, so Lisa, with that, as we think about how to solve this crisis together and kick off a great day, we've got a great session with you coming later. One more housekeeping item, just to remind people, I see people are introducing themselves in the chat, which is fantastic. We do have a Q&A. Questions, typically, just to remind you, are best when they're brief and actually end with a question mark. 
uh, and so that your, your moder our moderators can get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, there will be some other nice surprises in the chat. For example, one of our sponsors, Every Table, will be providing an offer for two free meals and free delivery of their nutritious home delivered meals to all attendees. Uh, so more details to come on that. But uh, now, as you mentioned, uh, the work that we've all done in this area, uh, thankfully it's based in evidence and we're not just shooting from the hip. We know that this is a meaningful issue uh, that crosses so many aspects of our lives. So we're gonna hear now from Julianne Holt Lundstedt who is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. She's focused on, the understand, on understanding the association between social relationships and physical health. And she was a key member of the recent National Academy of Science uh, Consensus Committee, which we'll be hearing about more in a bit. So I think Julianne will do a great job uh, bringing us all up to speed on the issue of loneliness and social isolation. So with that, uh, let's hear from Julianne. In light of the current pandemic, this topic of social isolation and loneliness is more timely than ever. It's important to recognize that social isolation and loneliness are not the same thing. Social isolation is objectively being alone, having few relationships or infrequent social contact. Loneliness is subjectively feeling alone, the discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. Even prior to the current COVID-19 pandemic, there was evidence that a significant portion of the population was already socially isolated, lonely, or both. According to a 2018 AARP study, one in three adults, 45 and older, are profoundly lonely. And another survey suggests that it may actually be much higher. Loneliness prevalence rates were rising even before the pandemic. Loneliness occurs across any age, income, level, living situation, and gender. However, the highest rates were among those with lower incomes, LGBTQ+, and those living alone. Since the pandemic and the necessary stay-at-home and social distancing recommendations, 20 to 30 percent of adults report that they are feeling lonelier now than pre-COVID. Other research has demonstrated a threefold increase in mental distress. It's important to recognize that this is more than just feeling distressed. Social isolation and loneliness can actually kill. This deadly effect goes beyond the increases in risk for suicide and domestic violence to also include death from all causes. My research, which includes data from over 3.4 million participants, shows that loneliness increases risk for earlier death by 26%, social isolation by 29%, and living alone by 32%. Across decades of research, we now have evidence that the health risks are comparable to smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day and exceed that of obesity and air pollution. In fact, we have robust evidence across a variety of health outcomes, including physical health, for instance, increased risk for heart attack and stroke, type 2 diabetes, and even it's been linked to greater susceptibility to cold viruses and respiratory illnesses. This has also been linked to mental and behavioral health outcomes, including increased risk for depression and anxiety, substance abuse, and poorer sleep. It's also been linked to cognitive health, including mild cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. Social isolation and loneliness even influences economic outcomes. The mounting evidence is so substantial that our recent National Academy of Science report identified social isolation and loneliness as a major public health concern. Based on this evidence, we made several important policy recommendations and the current pandemic has only made these recommendations even more urgent. It's clear that no one sector can solve this important issue alone, but together we can begin to create the change we so desperately need. One of the things that I feel like has been somewhat of a silver lining of this pandemic is the greater awareness of just how important our relationships are. And, you know, not only getting through this current crisis, but 
getting through the everyday crises of everyday life, we need each other. And I hope that people will start really prioritizing their relationships in their everyday life and reaching out to others and looking out for those most vulnerable in their communities. This really is a crisis that we can solve together. Okay, an important message there from Julianne. Again, I saw something in the chat that really struck me about how hard it is to hear those statistics, particularly from the perspective of somebody who's long suffered from loneliness. Um, so um, this is really timely. Now we will hear a message from the first partner of California, a filmmaker, founder of the Representation Project, and I'll note, Honorary Chair of the California Volunteers Commission, which supports California volunteers and is tasked with uniting Californians in service and empowering them to take action in their communities. So with that, a video message from Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Siebel Newsom, first partner of California and other half to my husband, Governor Gavin Newsom. I wanted to welcome all of you here today to the Motion Picture and Television Fund Social Isolation Summit. And I wanna thank you for the incredibly important work you do to help our seniors here in California. As you all know well, human connection and relationships are critical to our overall health and well-being. So while COVID-19 has required us to be more physically distant from one another than ever before, we know that being socially connected is perhaps more important than ever. As both the first partner of California and the chair of California Volunteers Commission, I've been so proud of all the different way that Californians have stepped up to take care of each other. In particular, our seniors who are most at risk for COVID-19. And I've been really proud of the efforts our state has made to ensure that our most vulnerable seniors have what they need during this time, which includes human connection. Through various state efforts from the Neighbor to Neighbor campaign to the Friendship Line to the recently launched Social Bridgers Project, California, Californians across the state are checking in and connecting with millions of seniors who otherwise would not have these crucial touch points of human relationship and interaction. And thanks to the Great Place program, which allows local restaurants to deliver meals to homebound seniors, we've now delivered over 2 million meals to homebound seniors across the state who would not otherwise qualify for state assistance, giving these seniors additional points of human care and compassion that we know are absolutely critical to their health and well-being. And this only touches the surface of the various ways that folks in our communities are making a difference for the most vulnerable among us. In fact, recently I had the pleasure of joining California volunteers to support a local, local grocery bag uh, initiative and in partnership with Sacramento Republic soccer team and Raleigh's grocery store. The seniors we visited have been receiving groceries weekly from the program. And they said that seeing volunteers show up every week at their door with a week's supply of food, a smile and a caring conversation was often the highlight of their week. It reminded me that I should never doubt what a difference even just one small act of kindness can make in someone's life. And it inspired me to continue the work ahead because I know we have so much more to do to ensure that every senior is cared for, not just with regard to their physical health, but again, for their mental health and emotional health. And that's why we are here today to renew our commitment to that purpose. So thank you again for being here to explore how we can do better for our seniors and for your dedication to the people of this great state. Each of you makes California proud, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Enjoy the summit. Well, thank you for that welcoming message, and what a great message to begin with. I'm going to be joined now by Ina Jaffe, who is a veteran NPR correspondent covering uh, aging in America. Her stories on Morning Edition and All Things Considered have focused on older adults' involvement in politics and election. Yeah dating and divorce, work and retirement, fashion and sports, as well as issues affecting long-term care and end-of-life choices. And by the way, in 2015, she was named one of the nation's top influencers in aging by PBS publication Next Avenue, which uh, wrote Jaffe was reinvented, uh, sorry, wrote that Jaffe reinvented reporting on aging. So, uh, Ina, thank you for being here. I know you're gonna kick us off with our first session, Confronting Loneliness, in a turbulent world, acting now to prevent a social recession amidst the greatest health, economic, and social challenges of our time. And with the figures we're seeing on the resurgence of COVID and the economic figures, uh, I think that holds true today now more than ever. Thanks, Scott, for the nice introduction. Good morning and welcome, everybody. 
I want to introduce the uh, panelists you'll be hearing from in a moment. Uh, we will be hearing from Kim McCoy Wade. She's the director of the California State Department on, of Aging. And that means she oversees home and community services for older adults. She's also part of the team that's developing and implementing Governor Newsom's new master plan for aging. And she has a law degree from NYU. She's previously held uh, led organizations that support women in the workplace and provide food for the hungry. We're also going to be uh, joined by Mark Friedman. He's the originator of the idea of connecting midlife professionals to second acts in mission-driven organizations. To that end, he's founded the Encore Fellowships and Experience Corps, which mobilized adults 50 plus to work in disadvantaged public schools. His most recent project is Gen to Gen, connecting older adults with children. And he's written five books. Uh, we are going to be joined later, we hope. Uh, he's been a little bit delayed by Sachin Jane. He's a physician and the incoming CEO of the SCAN Group and Health Plan, a nonprofit healthcare organization with a focus on helping seniors age in place. Before that, he was CEO of Caremore and Aspire Health, and they are health, integrated healthcare delivery companies. Under his leadership, Caremore built programs to address loneliness and address the clinical needs of highest risk and highest need patients. So uh, we'll um, kick off our conversation with Kim. Are you there? There you are, Kim, hello. <laughs> um, so, um, Actually, I have a, an observation to make. First, we've all had the opportunity lately to experience some loneliness and isolation. And it, this may be a moment, therefore, where uh, the larger community can relate more to um, the situation in which so many older adults find themselves. And in fact, I, I imagine even seniors who are active and social um, have experienced some loneliness and isolation in the last few months. Um, it may even come as a shock to them. And uh, I wanted to ask Kim, um, with the end of uh, senior centers, well, not the end of them, but the closing of them, and uh, the lack of congregate meals and so on and so forth, uh, what are the things that um, the Department of Aging can do to overcome uh, social isolation and loneliness, both for the people who have had that experience chronically and for the newly lonely, if I can call them that, um, the older adults who were um, not isolated before, as well as the ones that were. Um, is that uh, something you can do with digital media, with, a, with um, what, what are the um, tools that you have to cope with that? Thank you, Ina, and thank you. So great to be here with uh, this distinguished panel of uh, thought partners as we tackle this uh, enormous challenge at this uh, challenging time in California. So yes, uh, everything has changed in the last few months, uh, and the only uh, real hope, as we said, as was said at the introduction, is that we are not going to go back to normal. We are going to go forward to a new reality. And what you see on the ground, and I see many of these uh, California partners and leaders already in the chat. It's so wonderful. People have both expanded their services to meet the moment and redesigned them. So you're exactly right. That senior center now is delivering that meal, delivering that activity, calling. Phone calls have been the best technology, but increasingly using more technologies to do online and uh, smart speaker and other activities to stay engaged with folks. So I think there has been kind of a, uh, a revolution in traditional uh, aging network services. But I think it's also very interesting what you say is there's incredible awareness uh, and empathy from the larger community. Um, and I mean that in a couple different ways. I mean that from perhaps younger people volunteering in a new way. I, per I mean it also from perhaps younger, older people, early 60s, uh, thinking about themselves in a new way and their role and their purpose and their aging. Um, I think we're also seeing people who, I, I hear from single parents who are extremely lonely and challenged right now, thinking about loneliness. So we both have this new awareness of the challenges that we face as we live at home, uh, age at home, perhaps we're aging at home alone, but we also have more um, opportunity. I'm not sure we're doing it fully, but opportunity to be aware of that interconnectedness 
And how do we both uh, um, build on that, that we, we're all having loneliness, but also particularly meet the needs of a very diverse group of uh, older Californians and Americans, diverse in age, diverse in functionality, diverse in life experience, income, uh, race, and, and, and experiences of race and uh, language in this country. So really understanding there's not just one loneliness story, there's many, uh, and how we meet that moment is, is really important. You mentioned something about um, that uh, senior centers, for example, uh, distribute meals rather than people gathering at the senior center for them. And then right after that, you said something about um, also activities. How do you get activities to people who are um, a, uh, sheltering in place? Oh, I, got, I hope uh, many of my partners can start putting ideas in the chat, but you would not believe the creativity and the inspiration, whether it is dropping off mask making kits, dropping off gardening kits, uh, dropping off song lyrics so that you can sing out your window. Uh, there's been so many um, uh, concerts from the driveway, uh, you can, you just, you name it, that this, this industry is uh, thinking of it and doing it and volunteers are stepping forward, professionals are calling on all of their talents, uh, really to deliver services in just new and different ways. And you, you hear it more in the news about kind of school graduations got reinvented with parades. Well, that same, our school distance learning got re is getting reinvented, again, with challenges on access and skills for lots and lots of folks. But that same revolution is happening in aging services. Uh, and how do we do graduate, our version of graduations, our versions of distance learning, how do we do that in new and different ways? Thanks, Kim. That was really interesting. Um, I want to turn to Mark now. Um, you turned the idea of social isolation on its head, um, that solving the problem of loneliness isn't something that needs to be done for older people, but that to a large extent, older adults have the power to solve this problem in their own hands. And um, you came up with the idea of what the opposite of loneliness is. I wonder if you could talk about that. <laughs> yeah, well, just to echo the, the great comments by Kim, I, I think of that old song lyric, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I think that as we become more and more aware of the problem of loneliness and all of the ways that it can um, diminish people's lives and, and their health, I think there's a simultaneous body of understanding that that relationships are really important. The opposite of loneliness, as you were saying, Ina, and there are a, a huge uh, accumulation of, of knowledge now that relationships um, can do the opposite um, of the damage of, of isolation and that they can bring uh, great meaning into our lives, build our health. Um, and that's particularly true of older adults, because I, I think that um, we now know that older adults are potential uh, uh, agents of connection and have a kind of superpower around relationships. As we get older and we realize there are fewer days ahead than behind, there's now a lot of research that we turn to relationships. You know, somebody tells you you've got 30 days left to live, you don't think this would be a terrific time to learn the oboe, right? You focus on the people who are most important to you, to connection, and it turns out in later life, the skills of connection blossom. Our knees may ache, our eyesight might not be as good, but emotional regulation, empathy, all blossom as we move into the latter decades. And it turns out we now know also that these bonds are the key to happiness. The Harvard study of adult development, I think in its 84th year, has shown that relationship and happiness are inextricably intertwined. George Vellant, who led that study, says happiness is love, full stop. So I think what this brings me to is even as we're doing the essential work of trying to alleviate loneliness, how can we move towards uh, an agenda around building connection. You know, the UK has a minister of loneliness. I think we should have a minister of relationship here in America, thinking proactively how we can prevent loneliness, how we can move upstream, um, and how older adults themselves can be um, some of the most important uh, assets of society in building these bonds. And I think we have been joined by Sachin Jane. I see him nodding. Hello. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, congratulations on um, your being uh, the new uh, CEO of Scan Health. 
Thank you very much. That just happened this morning, I understand. It did. That's why I was a little bit delayed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a good excuse. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the idea that um, people like Kim and um, those who she works with are going to address the, these problems, but you have suggested that it's in everybody's power to solve the problems of loneliness and isolation. And I wonder how you envision that happening. Yeah, I mean, I've been working in this space now for five years. Um, when I was at Caremore, we launched um, something called the Togetherness Program, uh, which uh, was really aiming to address what we believe was an epidemic in plain sight. You know, you see and meet seniors and you, really, you realize that loneliness is such a dominant part of the experience of being a senior citizen. I think organizations like Caremore, like the Department of Aging, um, have you know, built amazing programs to help. But the reality is, is that this is not a problem that requires a new drug. It's not a problem that requires a new uh, you know, medical device to be pioneered. It's frankly a problem that requires a new social contract. Um, we need to think differently about who we are as a society, how we think about intergenerational connectedness, how we feel about our neighbors. And the idea I'm, I'm sharing isn't a new one. Um, my professor in college, uh, Robert Putnam, wrote about this in the book Bowling Alone, where he talked about the fact that the United States actually had a different social contract in the 1940s and 50s uh, and 60s coming out of World War II, um, where we did feel a greater sense of civic responsibility, a greater sense of community. And I think some of what you're seeing right now, you know, more broadly beyond, you know, this topic of loneliness, you know, whether it's the COVID-19 crisis and, you know, our society's response to it, or some of the racial unrest, is the fact that we don't really have a social contract that includes the individual and also includes the community. And so I think, you know, never waste a crisis coming out of this, you know, very challenging moment that we're in, we need to begin to have a national conversation, especially going into this election cycle, where we do talk about the role of the community and the role of the individual and community and how we are part of something bigger. We need to talk about the American family and how, you know, perhaps multi-generational families actually continue to have a place in our society. We can build all the programs we want in the world, but the reality is if people who are connected to one another um, actually cared for one another in the ways that they once used to, um, we could solve this problem tomorrow. Um, every one of us has the power to pick up the phone or get in a car and go visit a grandparent or, or, um, or call a grandparent and you know, address their loneliness and build that social connection. And one of the interesting observations I've had in my own personal journeys you know, in trying to you know, connect more with um, older individuals and older adults in my life is this realization that connection builds connection. That first conversation is always awkward. You really don't have much to talk about. Um, and what we all need more of is context with one another. And we need training on how to actually build more context with, with one another. And so, again, I think we're, you know, um, we tend to, you know, medicalize or, or build, you know, kind of take a social services lens on this. I take more of a social contract view of this, which is that we need to rethink what it means to be a part of American society, what it means to have neighbors, what it means to be a part of a family. Because I think if we actually go back to some of those uncomfortable conversations, we may actually unlock the solutions without, you know, spending a dollar. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that's where my thinking has evolved to, even as I think we need to build programs like the ones that we're all talking about and that we've all been engaged in. I do think um, they're band-aids on what it, what is, you know, frankly, a, a reflection of how fractured we are as a, as a society and as a country. So how do you start that? So I think it's, it starts with every single one of us. I mean, the reality is, is that each one of us has the opportunity from the various platforms that we occupy to kind of reinstantiate the importance of connection and, and connectedness. Um, you know, I have the pleasure and, and privilege of taking on leadership of SCAN today. Um, a big part of what I'm going to be focused on is building that sense of togetherness and connection in the workplace. Um, in, and, uh, you know, the truth is, is that loneliness is not a problem just experienced by seniors. It's experienced by people who work in cubicles who never talk to each other all day. And so I think, again, every one of us can start to reimagine our workplace, our families, the communities that we live in, and begin to 
to with whatever platforms we have create more connection we just have to prioritize it and value it and i think you know in a corporate setting we've prioritized profit over everything else um you know in other settings we prioritize other things over all else we have to start making community and connection a top priority otherwise it's not going to actually happen so um we had a question from uh, one of the attendees um, who was talking about, um, well, we've had a couple of questions talking about people who may not be comfortable with digital technology or talking about how um, some of these programs or activities could be adapted to um, homeless people who, while they may be living in a tent right next to somebody else's tent, still may be very socially isolated. And I wonder if any of you have any thoughts on those two issues? Surely you've got on at least the digital one. Yeah, sure. thank you. I'm happy to speak to, I, mean, I think that the, the point that Dr. Jane's making, that you're making around connection uh, has to happen in many ways in all settings. So yes, the telephone is important. Yes, digital divide is important. And digital divide is, uh, is, about, the it's about the device. Right, some devices require so much more, some less. It's about the affordability. It's about the broadband. It's about the content being useful and interesting and relevant at that stage in your life. So there's much work to do, and we are we are building on work of some of the leaders in San Diego and LA and San Francisco, and doing that and looking at our tech industry partners here in Silicon Valley to help us go further faster in that. Uh, and that's absolutely right. Uh, the, the the work with people without a homes, with people in congregate facilities, people behind bars. Uh, isolation and loneliness happens in all different physical settings, and we do need all those multiple settings. Um, I, I wanted to circle back, though, to family and friends as that front line. Um, that's absolutely true, and, and certainly as you define family with that, in all the different ways that families are formed, families of choice, families of neighbors, uh, of all different kinds of family. I think that, and, and there's more we can do, and we are doing, and I'm happy to speak to on, on in-person visitation. I think that's where we're at three to four months in. It's kind of the hottest topic is when and how do we bring in-person visitation back. But I want to say, while there is great in our tradition and great in many cultural traditions around that family caregiver role, there is also a huge expectation of unpaid labor, particularly of women, to provide that, that kind of uh, go beyond connection to actually then support and follow up. And we do need to figure out as a society, are we gonna support families in providing that connection and providing that care? How do we make it easier to get that information, get that skills to pay for some respite, all the things we wanna do so that uh, we aren't all on, on our own out here trying to find those connections and find those supports. So we do need to both build a culture, build on our tradition, many cultures traditions still to live today of deep family and friend connection, but we also have to make it possible to do it uh, in this economy, and it's very expensive and out of reach for so many families. Maybe I'll jump in on, on Kim's comment as well, and, and um, also some thoughts that were uh, prompted by Dr. Jane. And I, I agree that we need to put connection front and center as a value, but I think we also need to understand that the loneliness crisis that we're seeing today, not just with older people, but all across society, it was created by a whole series of decisions that we've made, structural decisions over the last century. We started the 20th century as the most age integrated society in the world, and we ended it arguably as the most age segregated. And we reorganized life in America. So uh, older people were moved to a set of institutions that are really primarily almost exclusively for older people. and they were cut off from the community. And at the same time, we created an ethos of later life that um, moved against the idea of purpose and engagement. And so to turn that around, it's gonna take individual action, but it's also gonna take social innovation. You know, we invented <laughs> retirement communities, senior centers, um, um, nursing homes, a whole set of, so of public policies, and many of which serve to create walls between older people in the community. And I think we're gonna be, need to be as creative in bringing people together as we've been about separating them out. And uh, the happy news there is that I, I think there's a wave of social innovation already underway. Many of them, uh, many of the most creative ideas led by young people who want older people to be 
engage in society, many of them happening in California. So I think that's going to need to go hand in hand with the ethos uh, that we've been talking about, build around connection. You know, we've been talking about older adults as if that's one thing to a great extent. And we all know that it's not. Um, we're talking about three or maybe even four generations when we talk about older adults. And are there differences that you see in those different generations as to what the needs are and what the abilities to contribute are? Um, and what, uh, how the larger society needs to uh, respond and react to those needs and abilities? Yeah, I, I wanna, you know, I, I wanna answer the question responding a little bit um, to a comment made earlier around the digital divide and the fact that, you know, older Americans um, can't, you know, this, I think the stereotype that older Americans are kind of slower to adopt technology or unable to adopt technology as a, as a solution, um, that ends up being kind of a justification for, you know, a stratification around solutions for loneliness that oftentimes um, kind of robs certain people of actually, you know, digital solutions and tools. I think what we've seen through this COVID-19 crisis that when pushed to and when forced to use digital tools, everyone uses them. <laughs> um, and, and so I think our, our, you know, the stratification that you refer to is real, but I often think we, we sometimes don't give enough credit to older adults in terms of their ability to use tools and technologies to connect with one another. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of those stereotypes have actually melted away in the last few months as older Americans have increasingly turned to um, a, a large, you know, diversity of technological tools to connect with one another. Um, I'm starting to see, you know, companies that used to not focus at all on, on older, Amer older adults begin to kind of gear their, you know, their newest technologies. You know, Facebook just introduced their portal device, which I think um, is, they're now thinking about as a tool to address loneliness. So I think we, we have to kind of also just revisit some of our, you know, kind of basic assumptions that oftentimes I think get, a, get in the way of solutioning um, because we, we do create these artificial distinctions of, between kind of tech avid and, and, um, and you know, tech phobic seniors and a, as we kind of try to stratify them. Could you tell me more about that portal? Yeah, I actually, just bought, I, I actually just bought one for my mother. Um, it, it is an amazing device. It has a widescreen, I don't want this to be an advertisement for Facebook, but um, it, has a, it has a widescreen uh, and also a panning camera that actually, you know, kind of will go to whoever's speaking in a room. And so it creates just a much higher quality home video conferencing tech, you know, technology solution. It also is extremely easy to use. And so um, when it comes to actually creating, you know, connection over video conference, it oftentimes some of the dynamics that um, make it actually hard to create connection, you know, the fact that it is just a sterile view um, actually changes because the camera actually pans to someone moving in a room. And so you can create a more lifelike experience when someone's actually, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, connecting over, over the device. So I think we're going to start to see technological innovation. I think there have been some great companies that have focused in this area for years, like GrandPad is, is one that I've had some exposure to. Um, you know, again, I think we need to think differently about how technology can be a solution here um, and not be afraid to, you know, one of the things I got, I, I was afraid of, frankly, when I did start working in the senior care space was the idea that, you know, seniors, I bought into the, the kind of stereotypes that seniors don't want to use technologies. I think in this loneliness space in particular, it can be a huge part of the solution. It's, you know, it's also part of what isolates us. I think our, our connection and attachment to technology isolates us, but I think geared, you know, appropriately, it can be a big part of the solution. Mark? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I, um, I feel like while there are differences uh, in all of these different phases of later life that are opening up as, as our lives keep expanding, um, I think there's some consistency as well. Freud said that the keys to life and to happiness were love and work, strong social ties and a reason to get up in the morning. And I think that's true for a 60-year-old, for a 90-year-old, for a 70 year old, I think we have to be more creative, though, to create those opportunities all along the way. I, I was thinking as we were having this discussion of the reason I got into this area to begin with, which is my own grandmother, who um, 
who retired and was alone. Had, I remember visiting her. The TV was always on just to hear a voice, and she was actually smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, and out of desperation, she joined a program called RSVP that's part of the Senior Corps. They sent her to a hospital where she pushed a gift card around, but she met a whole cadre of new friends who um, not only provided meaning to her life, but when she got emphysema as a result of those 15 cigarettes a day, they were the ones who took her to the hospital who were holding her hands to the very end. And I think that this intersection of purpose and loneliness is true all throughout life and all throughout later life. And I think we need to work hard to, uh, to provide better opportunities for older people in both ways. So um, we did have a question earlier that I, apologies, um, sort of got mashed in with the digital technology question, which was, um, and can you address this briefly? Maybe you'd like to go into more detail. Um, what were the um, ways that loneliness and isolation could be addressed uh, amongst uh, homeless individuals uh, who uh, as a group are, as we all know, getting older. Yes, well, I mean, again, forgive me for being glib, but I think, you know, the biggest thing that people without homes need is homes. Uh, and, and that's their biggest difference from the rest of us. Uh, and as we are moving as a state with Project Room Key turning into, which is a temporary housing for people with COVID homeless, close to 15,000 people, we're moving that to Home Key to have that be permanent housing. I mean, then the question comes, what do we do in housing so that we don't just become isolated? I mean, there are, this is a big problem in California, both the housing problem and the isolation problem. And they are, they are not, uh, they're not, uh, they are connected. Um, we had a, a Wednesday webinar where we have a topic of interest of aging and hundreds of people call in and on housing, yes, affordability was the big issue. But the other question was what, what Mark touched on is how do we build a housing that brings us together, doesn't push us apart? How do we have multi-generational housing? Housing where we can um, turn in our driver's license and still walk and see people and be around. How am I not sitting on a four bedroom house uh, if I'm wealthy as I retire that no longer is right for me? Or if I am, can I co-share and co-house? So all these very, in rural communities saying, we've got plenty of space. We don't have the right zoning to do multi-generational, affordable, near a uh, walkable uh, housing. So the, the real interest in housing was so interesting to me. It was obviously affordability, but right up there was the housing that drives connectivity and community and uh, family options and aging options. So you can stay at home. Those were the top two priorities. And that's what we'll be building into the master plan for aging is that kind of forward thinking, not just more housing, but different housing. So this is something that has been on my mind um, and it touches all, all ages, um, not only um, older adults, but certainly older adults may be more impacted um, by, by the situation. We've talked about this being a moment to draw people's attention to the issue of loneliness and isolation because we've all experienced a little bit of that, no matter what our before times lives were like. And I worry that sometimes with everyone working from home and restaurants being closed more or less sometimes, and theaters being closed and everybody being on Zoom as we all are now, um, we, that um, we're in danger of, of losing our connections to each other, that it will be hard to rebuild um, what we've lost over what looks like it's going to be many more months. And I wonder if that's something that you have been thinking about, either as it involves society as a whole or involves older adults. Yeah, I mean, I'll just restart. I mean, I think it, it depends on whether, you know, you're an optimist or a pessimist and whether you kind of appreciated or liked our baseline before. I didn't, I, you know, I think we were going in the wrong direction as a society on this. And I do think that this is a moment where we, you know, uh, where we do have an opportunity to kind of rethink um, our, our overall kind of connection to society and what we prioritize. Um, I don't think we were as deliberate about this at all as a society before. We, you know, we did have our connections. We are feeling that sense of loss, but I think we could do so much better. I think there's an opportunity for us to get to a higher plane here. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that coming out of this with the sense of loss that you, you referred to, that we will start to think collectively as a society about how we can get to that higher plane um, and, and build on this opportunity 
to, you know, to a place where, you know, you, you know your neighbors, um, where you look out for each other, where you are connected in deeper ways to your family members. I don't, I don't think our social capital levels were particularly high, so I don't think we should be mourning um, that loss. I think we should be looking forward and thinking, how do we get to a place where they're even higher, even though they're, they're lower right now? So um, please go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I think, again, without being, I, I, Sasha, I'm not sure I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm trying to be right in the realist space as we travel this, uh, this months and years. But I think there is this piece on technology where it is, it is, it is actually more inclusive uh, and more accessible so that more people are able to attend the religious service or the city council meeting uh, or the family reunion because of the technology. Now we have to deal with affordability and broadband and all that. But for aging and disabled folks, there's a way in which it has, there has been more connectivity, whether we can sustain that uh, and whether that, the, the meaningfulness of that is the same are very, very good questions. But I think there are ways in which it is bringing people in and bringing people together that when we are in a new world, one of the questions that Mark raised, are we reopening rebuilt, uh, senior centers or are we reopening community centers with multi-generational programming and staffing. So when you see when I'm in Los Angeles and see the LGBTQ center with a, a senior center next to the teen center, right across the, the patio, uh, that is a sort of a more forward leaning and looking space um, than I think the, the senior centers with all their great work. So I think there's some opportunity there. I will say that we are really, the space we're at now, um, four months in California is really this question of in-person visits is, is, is uh, top of mind for everybody. Um, uh, for, for all the reasons that I think we all know. Wonderful as technology is, wonderful as the phone is, there is something about in person. And we're at a moment where we have seen, uh, particularly Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, people gathered, and it's looking like it put us at risk. It put more of us at risk. And so we have to figure this out. Um, we have just issued in our state the beginnings of guidance for resuming some, some in-person visits in senior centers and congregate living under some circumstances with all kinds of precaution, recognizing how critical these visits are for emotional health, physical health uh, of everyone, both sides of the, the family, family or friend dynamic. Uh, and I think we're looking at that. Is, is it possible to provide appropriately safe public health guidance on supportive in-person visits for people living at home I know some of us are, are standing on the front porch and calling through the front door, but what would that in-person, no touching, no contact, distance, masks, all those things would have to be in place. But, uh, and those of us who are across the country, you know, that's a whole other barrier. But I do think the public health community is wrestling with the mental health community on what does in-person visits, how, how can we uh, come to some place on that that supports our total health? And I think we're working through that very, very difficult question. We're um, getting uh, close to the end of our time, but I wonder if any of you have a comment to make on how we're going to bring more people then into this digital world because uh, affordability is a problem for some. Well, I'm going, to let, I'm going to let Sasha answer because I think that uh, because one of the core things this does is telehealth, right? Technology does telehealth as well as uh, social health, as well as exercise, as well as so many uh, ordering your groceries online from delivery. So I'm beginning to wonder when it becomes as part, it becomes a utility, when it becomes part of your healthcare uh, equipment, when it becomes part of uh, your home care package, uh, when do we normalize it not as an add-on, but actually as the core? So I'm wondering if, if, if Dr. Gerard has any thoughts on that. I, I think we're never going to go back to the way things were. I mean, I think what we've proven is that there is um, so many things that we made excuses about not being able to do, primarily because of how we actually paid for them, um, are now being done out of necessity and we're realizing that they're delivering great you know personal experience great consumer experience um, I, I do think you know the healthcare world is going to move to be almost fully digital coming out of this um, and with in-person where it's absolutely required but I think we created a lot of fake requirements for in-person that have kind of melted away over the last three or four months um, you know I've uh, you know accompanied a family member to a first visit with an oncologist uh, just a couple of days ago and you know, it was a f spectacular visit. It was empathetic. It was warm. It was kind. Um, and it was very thorough. And I think it was a positive experience for all. So 
without exposing uh, the person to COVID-19. And so, again, I think we are, we are going to be rethinking everything. I think as far as, um, you know, technology infrastructure, I think Medicare Advantage is going to be a vehicle through which um, a lot of technology infrastructure can be given to seniors over time. I mean, I think that's, that hasn't happened historically. You've saw in the last couple of years, you know, Medicare Advantage plans experimenting with giving smart watches, you know, to, to engage seniors more in their health. But I think you may start to see them, you know, giving them devices through which to access all of their care, um, you know, to close some of the digital divide. And you're going to start to see, you know, kind of networks of, of clinicians that work almost primarily through, um, through digital tools and technology. So I, I think there's going to be a broader reimagination of the healthcare system um, that's going to be ex both exciting and also, you know, compelling. That said, I'm still, you know, I don't, I don't want to be kind of the futurist here. I mean, I, I really believe that in-person connection matters a lot. Um, and so, you know, I, I just think um, you do have to remember that so many people are mobility impaired and going to the doctor's office is like a huge deal because it requires family members. It requires, and, and now all of a sudden you can asynchronously, you can synchron, you can beam your, your physician into your home, uh, you know, at a moment's notice. And so I think, again, um, we have to kind of continue to evolve. We, we, some of the clinical models need to be home-based and we're going to see more primary care delivered at home to frail homebound seniors. And so again, I think the site of care is going to change quite dramatically. I think technology is going to be an enabler of that. Um, I'm not sure I answered the question, but I appreciated uh, the opportunity. Yeah. That is a great answer. It's, it's really inspiring actually to think of the ways, positive ways in which, uh, we might all change as a result of what we've been through the last few months. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, Mark Friedman, Kim McCoy uh, Wade, and uh, Dr. Sachin Jain um, for joining us today. This was a really interesting discussion. I wish we could go on forever, but we can't because there are other really interesting people who want to talk. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Ina. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dr. Jane. Thanks. Well, thank you to our moderator, Ina Jaffe, and our incredible panelists there. So true, so many good points. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin, but yes, a defining moment whether we're optimists or pessimists, uh, however you look at it, there's so much we have to do now. And it, if you look at this convergence of the viral pandemic and the loneliness epidemic uh, with the cases at over 40,000 per day in the United States heading into a holiday weekend, it's obvious that we have to continue to work to find ways to help people feel connected and keep them safe and engaged while they're physically distanced. Um, and there is this double-edged sword of technology, right? Uh, here we are, thousand of us here on this uh, webinar today, uh, spread out all over the country. And yet I'm sure some of us are feeling so alone. Uh, so again, I encourage you to connect through the chat. And I see we're seeing so many great questions, uh, questions for the moderators in the Q&A, and then discussion between attendees in the chat. I encourage you to continue that. Uh, there have been some great suggestions about ways to continue the conversation, and I encourage you to go to our website, mptf.com, to do just that.